Hello, my name is Emily Bynan and this video is the third in the series My Five Favourite Flute Books. In the previous videos, I've talked about two books by the great French flautist Marcel Moyse, his 24 Little Melodic Studies and his seminal book on making a beautiful flute sound, De la Sonorité. Two essential components of any flute player's library. And in case you missed those links, I'll put them in the description box below too, in case you want to watch those afterwards. In this video, I'm going to talk about a book written by a virtuoso flautist and composer who was born in Maastricht, the Netherlands, in 1830, and who died in Rio de Janeiro aged just 50. His name was Mathieu André Reichert, and the book I'm going to talk about is his Seven Daily Exercises, Opus 5. Now, I've got a confession to make. Whilst, of course, I'd known about this book since my time at music college and had even been practicing one of the studies without realizing that it came from this book, I actually only acquired my own copy and started working on the entire book last year during the first lockdown. And I've enjoyed getting to know these studies enormously. There are seven daily exercises and each exercise starts in C major, then goes on to A minor, the relative minor, then goes through the entire cycle of fourths. So on to F major, D minor, B flat major, G minor, and so on. But I suppose you could just as well play each exercise going through the cycle of fifths if you like. C major, A minor, G major, E minor, D major, B minor, and so on. But whichever way you go through the keys, it's a wonderful exercise for reinforcing the cycle of how all the keys are related to one another. Now, given the rather unusual number of seven, I suppose the implication might perhaps be to play one exercise a day each day of the week. But sadly, he doesn't provide confirmation of this, nor does he offer us any advice, tips or suggestions as to how one should work on these exercises. The only thing he offers are the metronome marks. But to be absolutely honest, I find them all a little on the fast side. And these are such musical exercises that in my opinion, it's a shame to race through them as mere speedy finger exercises. Instead, I would like to suggest that we really take time and care to consider the shapes, the harmonies, where there's the most tension in the phrase and where we can release back to that relaxed tonic. Now, you might be able to whiz through them all at his tempo and give thoughtful consideration to these aspects. But there's no race, there are no medals, no competition to get through these as fast as possible. So why not see if you can't learn something more valuable perhaps by taking a bit more time? What will almost certainly need a little more time than he gives us are the breaths. I find that I need a little more time than he notates whatever the tempo is I'm taking. So don't worry about taking a bit more time or even adding an extra beat for the breath. The important thing is to remember that the breath in is the relaxed part of the blowing cycle. Take your time and listen to the air as it enters your body. Ideally, these exercises should be memorized so that you can close your eyes and really absorb and immerse yourself in careful listening, feeling your way through the subtle colors and characters of all the various keys. We should be able to carry around a C major version of all these exercises on a single A4 sheet and find our way from there. And if the idea of memorizing seems a little daunting, just start with the C major part and get that safely in your fingers, your mind and your ears. Then I would suggest initially skipping the relative minor and moving on to the next major key, initially the one flat F major. And by the time B flat major is safely in your fingers, it will be in your ears and your mind too. Then once you feel comfortable playing all the majors from memory, go back to A minor and repeat the process for the minor keys. At least that's the way I set about memorizing them. Well, I think we've done enough general talking, so let's take a look at the seven exercises. Number one. 
This is essentially quite a simple two octave scale exercise finishing with a two octave arpeggio. We could run through it in the tempo that he marks and I do do that sometimes to practice the whole line in one breath. But let's look at how we could explore and exploit this rather unassuming little exercise to squeeze the very best out of it and out of your playing. Start by looking at the 6-8 time signature. And remember that in any compound time, so 3-8, 6-8, 9-8, 12-8, whatever, we can achieve a lovely dancing lilt by lifting the second quaver or eighth note in that 3-8 grouping. So that's the micro phrasing. And in terms of the macro phrasing, the whole line, I would like to suggest the following. After a warm, full first note, the tonic or first degree of the scale, we make an elegant drop down to the second note, by which I probably mean a little release or diminuendo, then use the rising line to take us up to the next high note. We repeat this three times, the third time taking us up to the tonic an octave higher than the initial starting tonic note. Make sure that this highest note rings and sings out. And then we get two cascading descending scales. The first I would suggest a diminuendo, then the second maybe a crescendo taking us into a deep, healthy, low tonic before elegantly releasing the arpeggio to the higher tonic. Number two. Now, this is the exercise that I've been practicing for years without actually realizing that it came from this book. Essentially, we have the tonic chord alternating with a dominant seventh. It's such a very simple principle, but it's perhaps precisely this simplicity which lends itself to exploration with all kinds of variations. When I was initially learning it by ear, I started by going through the major chords chromatically from C major, C sharp major, D major, E flat major, and so on. But like the rest of this book, Reichert goes through the cycle of fourths, C major, F major, B flat major, and so on. Over the years of practicing this one, I've come to a fairly standard routine. I have 12 ways of practicing the sequence, one for each major and its relative minor. Each day I start on a different note and go through the entire sequence of keys and variations. But if you're just starting out, remember it's much better to do a couple of keys thoughtfully than to just try and race through the whole lot for the sake of it. Now, because this is not an exercise about breathing, I just breathe when and as I need to, always remembering that the breath in is the relaxed part of the cycle and should sound open and low even if it initially takes a little more time. Regarding dynamics, start with a comfortable, open sound, round and warm, I would say mezzo forte to forte. You can always switch up the dynamics later on. So let me take you through my current sequence of variations and you're welcome to do the same or to make up your own. So let's start this on C major and A minor as it's where Reichert begins. Variation one full open tone all legato enjoying each curve of the line taking time to sing through each note singing through each interval imagining that each note is a bead that you're threading onto a string and really taking your time to make sure you're finding the center of each note variation two full tonic note then a triplet leading into the first note of the next group Variation three, the other way round now, a triplet going to a quaver or eighth note. Variation four, three eight time, two semis and two quavers or two sixteenths and two eighths. Quite a steady tempo and a rather weighty tenuto articulation on the quavers or the eighths. Perhaps using duh, a voiced consonant rather than t. Variation five, again in three, eight, quaver, two semis, quaver, or eighth, 
2 8. Now using a medium staccato, perhaps moving now to T instead of D, a little faster but still with good air and sound. Variation 6, the last one now in 3 8, a little faster and a light staccato, quaver, quaver, two semis or 8 8 and 2 16. A scherzando character, short, crisp and clear. Variation 7. Now back to singing through the line and playing long legato slurs by chord. The first four notes under one slur, then after that by eight notes, in other words, by chord. Variation 8. Similar to variation 7, but now eight notes under the slur right from the beginning. So we change chord midway through the group of eight. Variation nine, slurring by groups of two notes. And sometimes I play these really sung through sostenuto and sometimes more lifted, uh, like a lighter classical articulation. Variation 10, the same as variation 9, but now going across the beat. Again, some days sostenuto and other days lighter and more lifted. Variation 11, this is a colour change exercise. So starting with an O colour on the tonic chord, then squashing down into a hard closed E sound for the dominant 7th. So the darker colour reinforces the heightened tension of the dominant. Variation 12, as variation 11, but now of course the other way around, going against the nature of the harmonic tension, if you like. Number three. For number three, we go back to that graceful dancing 6A to the first study. So the same principle applies here, that lilting lifting of the second and fifth quavers or eighth notes. In other words, if we put that first bar under the microscope, we would see something like a subtle diminuendo through the first three notes, then a gentle opening out of the sound towards the dominant, the G at the half bar, and again a slight release as we stretch up to the E, and then a little crescendo at the end of the bar taking us into bar two. So this study is really about those stretchy chewing gum intervals, remembering to keep the fingers just as smooth as the air. Enjoy the chromaticism in bar two as we touch on E minor and D minor, really singing through the F sharp and then the F natural, taking care of intonation of course, and feeling that harmonic tension which resolves into the more relaxed tonic in the last bar. Again, it is playable at the metronome mark he gives, and for fast finger practice, it certainly has its value. But I think that working on this one a little slower might ultimately be more revealing and therefore more useful. Number four. This one is basically a glorified tonic triad in the various positions. So in C major, we have the root position going up and down, First inversion, going up and down. Second inversion, going up and down. And back to the root position. And then all three positions down again to the simple broken arpeggio in the last bar. But what makes it so delicious are those juicy teasing tones and semitones around the third note in each of those triads. In the root position, the A and the F sharp are really pulling against the G and that's the moment we should really relish but not at the expense of the hierarchy of the beats in the bar. So in bar one the lowest note is the tonic and the bass of the root position chords and it's on the most important beat of the bar. So keep the embouchure hole open enough to let that lovely bass note sing out and resonate. Again, in the tempo Reichert marks, it's a useful fast finger exercise, though my ideal tempo is not much more than 126 or 132. Then you can sound fluent and flowing and still stay well in control of nice, even fingers. But another use I've found for this exercise is as a flexible, variable staccato exercise. I think of the lowest notes in each group as having a longish staccato, and as the notes come closer together, I play a slightly shorter, lighter staccato.
So it's a nice musical way of honing that technique of varying the note lengths within a staccato passage, something I often rely on in real life. Think of Mozart Concerto or Mendelssohn Scherzo or the Saint-Saëns Volière. Number five. This one is useful for the technique of bringing out bass notes or a bass line without using accents. Think, for example, of the bass lines in the Telemann fantasies. So instead of thumping out the important notes, try releasing the sound of the very repetitive middle voices. E.g. 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 F.g. 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 E.g. G, F, G, E, G, E, G, stop. You see, the ear is very clever and picks up repetition very well. So all those Gs can very easily dominate and we must therefore release the sound somewhat without losing that sense of a sostenuto legato feel. When I spoke the words, the most difficult part to say and to hear were when the harmonies changed more quickly and we added that chromaticism. So take your time and guide your fingers and the listener's ears through those quicker, more chromatic harmonies. Remember that the tonic is the relaxed harmony and the further we get away from that tonic as a general rule, the more tension or you might say the more special the chord is. Again, another focus for this exercise is keeping the intervals smooth and the fingers gentle. Number six. This is a very straightforward two octave chromatic scale with a tonic arpeggio in the last bar. It's the first time in the book that he stipulates that it's an articulated exercise. But just as I would suggest playing the earlier legato exercises with varying articulations, this one can also be a good one to practice legato. And although Reichert writes that it's a double staccato exercise, you may remember from my articulation video that I believe strongly that the best way to improve double staccato is to improve your single staccato. So I would definitely practice it single staccato too. You could also practice it gada 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 as well as the more usual daga 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 and vary the length of staccato sometimes too, from very short and crispy to a more portato stroke, a legato staccato. Number seven. This is a triple staccato exercise, and as I usually favour using a double tongue in grouped in threes, takadakataka, in this exercise I use the following articulation. Dai takataka, dai takataka. So, as ever, learn to say it before you play it. Try it out and you may also find this easier and more flowing than the more usual tai ta takata with the two T's next to each other. Just give it a go. As a final little tip, I would just like to reinforce the idea that quality of practice of this sort of exercise... <coughs> actually of anything is much more important than quantity. So set aside the time you think you can spare on these musical technical exercises. And if you get through an entire cycle of an exercise, that's great. If not, no problem. If you just do one sequence of one exercise with care and concentration, it will be more effective than racing through the entire sequence just for the sake of it. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next episode of my five favourite flute books. See you next time.